guys. <laughs> so many people here. Yeah, I'm Felix. What is it? I, I, should I use this? Okay. Hi guys. So I'm Felix. I work for Ethereum Foundation on the Go Ethereum client. And uh, my role there is mainly bug fixing and feature development, but I guess there's a lot less time for new features lately. And uh, my passion in this project has always been, you know, like taking care of the way that nodes talk to each other. And this is also what I'm talking about today. Hmm. So Death P2P uh, was in, came into existence, I guess, three, about three years ago. And at the time, the vision was to, <laughs> as you can read there, provide a lightweight abstraction layer that provides low-level algorithms, protocols, and services in a transparent framework. <laughs> so, you know, like it was a pretty grand vision. Um, in 2017, though, Dev P2P is just this thing that you need to implement to talk to the Ethereum blockchain. And it's part of all known Ethereum implementations. Um, so all of the six, seven implementations that are live on the network have an implementation of Dev P2P and all of the stuff that's in it. And um, there have been very few actual protocol changes since 2014. So um, if you wanted to, you could count them on one hand, basically. Uh, Death P2P has a bunch of uh, elements to it. So the first one is the node discovery protocol, which is a way of finding other nodes to talk to. Um, then there is the RLPX transport protocol, which is what it's spoken on the, on the TCP connections between nodes. And uh, finally, there's an application layer protocol that sits on top of the RLPX transport protocol. And um, this one is somewhat confusingly also called Dev P2P. <laughs> so both the overall system and this particular protocol are called Dev P2P. Uh, let me just walk you through the protocol uh, that's in use on the network today. And then maybe like um, we'll come to the part that can actually be improved about this. So this uh, dark circle there, that's, uh, that's us. So that's where Node that wants to connect to the Ethereum network. So how do we do that? So we'll join the DHT first. And the DHT is uh, basically the part that where, where is, is this thing where you can find the other nodes that are on the network. Um, yeah, so there are some other nodes. They're also registered there. And then basically, we walk to DHT at random to find someone to connect to. And then we try to establish a TCP connection to them. And um, the TCP connection uh, might actually fail. So this happens quite a lot because the node you know, might no longer be live or you know, it might be too busy handling other connections. But let's just assume that it works this time. So once the connection is established, um, we, ex we exchange capabilities with the other side. So basically, uh, this is now the part where like the Dev P2P application layer kicks in. And in this particular case, we see that the shared capabilities are, is it, there's just one shared capability and it's, um, it's the ETH capability in version 63. So now once ETH version 63 is running, we can exchange information about the blockchain that, that, that we're both on. And once that matches, we have a new peer. <laughs> yeah, so that's the current system. And um, it's not super efficient. And um, well, there's a whole bunch of details that I haven't really talked about. But you know, I, I guess you kind of get the idea. Um, so what, what can we improve about this, though? So first of all, you know, um, it's kind of annoying that there are so many round trips just to figure out whether someone is on you know, the right blockchain. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's kind of obvious. Um, and then it would be really nice to just sort of know that like before even connecting maybe. And then uh, another issue is that the whole system is basically frozen. So uh, making any change to any of the protocols requires like really tight coordinations, requires implementation consensus, and any change that we make needs to be backwards compatible. 
and uh, to achieve upgrades at all, what we've done in the past is we, we've made all the upgrades backwards compatible and we've tied them to Ethereum mainnet hard forks because well, everyone has to upgrade their node anyways, and then once the hard fork is successfully launched, we can start phasing out the old stuff and just, you know, only speak the new protocol. But, you know, hard forks don't happen all that often, and we'd rather, you know, make changes on an accelerated schedule, but it's, like, really not that possible. And then finally, because node discovery only relays information about the RLPX protocol, uh, there's really not there isn't like any sort of room for experimentation because, well, we're essentially stuck with RLPX and the crypto system that it uses. So improving these things is the Node Discovery version five effort. And with Node Discovery version five, we want to make two changes in particular, or rather we want to achieve two things in particular. So the first one is we'd rather, you know, be able to find nodes more efficiently. And then the second one is, we'd rather know more about those nodes before we even connect. So the first part of our solution to these issues is called ENR, which stands for Ethereum Node Records. So earlier in the V4 overview, you saw that the DHT holds all those E node addresses. And an E node address is really just a public key, an IP address, and two ports. Uh, Ethereum node records can hold arbitrary information about a node. So that's the main difference. Um, uh, so this arbitrary information, that can be information about the capabilities of the node. It can be information about other transport protocols spoken by the node. It can be initial key material for those, for those transports. Anything really, like as long as it fits into 300 bytes. <laughs> We're, we're basically, like, almost anything can be relayed there. And uh, the limitation of 300 bytes is important because ENR is a separate format, uh, a separate spec even, and it's not at all connected to the DHT. So you can relay those records through any other means if you want to, including, say, a DNS record or something like that. And then finally, node records are signed and also versioned. So if you have two versions of a record that, describe the same, that describes the same node, you can determine which one is newer, for example. And um, we think that ENR is a, is a good solution for the transport legality problem, because again, information about arbitrary transports can be relayed through this protocol. And um, well, yeah, because there's just a lot more room to put you know, information about anything. So um, we still need implementation consensus though, because you know, in order to be able to talk to everyone, everyone kind of has to agree on you know, what the language is that they're speaking to, uh, that they're using when speaking to each other. And uh, it is very likely that uh, uh, for a considerable amount of time, the lowest common denominator will be RLPX. But eventually, uh, once ENR is launched, we can actually, um, try out different transports, find a viable alternative, and then, you know, maybe like at the end of, of, of 2020, like delete RLPX. <laughs> so, um, in order to get ENR launched though, we need to upgrade the discovery protocol. Uh, this is something that needs to happen once, and it will be a backwards incompatible upgrade. So, likely, what will ha the way this will work is that the discovery version 5 DHT will be a totally separate DHT that will run in parallel to the current system. And um, because this is kind of a unique opportunity for us, in addition to you know, just including support for ENR, we want to make a bunch of other changes to the protocol. In particular, one problem that the V4 discovery, pro uh, one problem that the V4 discovery protocol has is its reliance on absolute time. So, uh, maybe, you know, some of you have actually experienced this, so if your clock is off, let's say by, by two minutes, you won't really be able to connect to the network. And uh, we've worked around this by, like, alerting users when their clock seems off, but that's a really ugly workaround, and, you know, like, we might just fix it in the protocol this time. And then, um, 
with many of the nodes uh, in the DHT, you'll find that the information that's listed there isn't very accurate. So you might you know, not be able to connect to this node at all even though it's listed there. And in V5, we want to introduce this concept of endpoint proofs where the DHT ensures that if a, if a node's record is listed in the DHT, you'll, there's a pretty fair chance that you'll actually be able to talk to it. And then finally, we have another, uh, we have another improvement, which is also, uh, which can be considered uh, an extension of the, of the DHT protocol. And this is the, uh, this one is about finding nodes more efficiently. So, um, hmm. in a um, classical DHT, so to say, um, the DHT is an index of nodes by, by their public key. And it, it maps uh, public keys to node endpoints. But, um, Well, so um, the nodes uh, in the DHT, though, they're not in any kind of useful order. So you'll find uh, an Ethereum mainnet node next to an Ethereum classic node next to a node that doesn't really participate in the Ethereum blockchain at all. And uh, there isn't really like an efficient way of like knowing about, you know, just the nodes that you care about. And um, contrasting that, the, uh, uh, at the, the topic index that we have in mind is sort of like uh, an index of all the nodes by, a, by, the, by the topic or the service that they are providing. Um, I don't have a lot of time to, to really go into the detail of how this works, but I can give you an overview of the design constraints that we set when, uh, when, 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 when making this protocol. So the first big constraint that we had is that we don't want to split up the DHT because the, with DHTs, bigger is better, right? I mean, um, fundamentally the security of a DHT depends on the number of participants in it, so you would want to like have, always have a very large number of participants. And um, another design constraint we had is that uh, these topics uh, kind of have to scale to an arbitrary number of participants. So there might be topics that everyone is advertising, like everyone who is who, who's in the whole network, but then on the other hand, there might also be topics that are very small and only advertised by let's say five or six different nodes. And uh, these topics shouldn't really compete with each other so you should be able to resolve both equally quickly. And then finally, um, with, 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 with all of these systems, there's always like the danger of you know, uh, people spamming it with like arbitrary registrations that nobody ever cares about. And uh, those particular registrations should not drown out, you know, the actual useful ones that you really want to see. And um, to combat many of these attacks, the um, topic advertisement protocol includes uh, this thing called advertisement inertia. So this is really just, you know, an artificial delay enforced by the protocol before a certain registration for a topic can go live. And um, we feel that, you know, in addition to maybe reducing misuse of this, uh, in addition to you know combating these attacks, this also reduces the uh, misuse of the topic index because fundamentally topics are meant to be used for announcing big decisions like way ahead of time, and those big decisions can be something like um, which blockchain you're on or which shard of the blockchain you're on or well you know things like that, and not so much like let's say the URL of a video chat that you know, you're just starting. So there's a, we really want those things to be used, you know, like for, uh, for, for, for facts that um, will have, you know, a, a, a bit of a bigger meaning. So uh, to recap, um, the node discovery version five is about finding nodes more efficiently and knowing more about those nodes before we connect. A prototype of the system, although without the ENR, has been in use by the Gethlight client since early 2017. Um, we're still working on the EIPs, so nothing is published yet, but uh, once it is, we will have like um, a separate spec for ENR, um, a document that goes into detail about, you know, like the semantics of the topic advertisement protocol, and finally, um, a description of the actual wire protocol that's spoken uh, via UDP. But there is really nothing set in stone yet. So uh, if you feel like you know there is a certain change that 
absolutely has to be made or a certain feature that should really be included or not included, just come talk to us. That's it.